in a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Dean Refresh, a show where I revisit the films, shows, and games from my childhood to try to take another look at what I fell in love with the first time. As always, I'm Dean Fisher, and I'm the only person on this podcast. Okay, I'm just going to (laughs) go. It's like, boy, I picked a great night to joke around. You guys are tired. I've had a week at work. I'm exhausted mentally. I'm apologizing in advance now that I'm going to be real spicy. And my mama taught me, if you ain't got anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So I love you guys. It's not in any kind of uh, slight against you guys. I'm just trying not to bring work home. I only speak when spoken to and Dean didn't say my name. That's the other part, too. It's like, well, you didn't introduce us, so I'm not going to say anything. I just want to see if anybody would interject and be like, why is he doing this? What That would be rude. Oh. Okay. I'm joined by my co-hosts on our lovely podcast about movies we all remember from childhood. We're trying to remember. Tim and Nick. I'm possessed. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> this was a. F- <clears throat> this wait, was what a is it? I haven't said it. What it is? What is it? What is it? What did? What was this? What was this acid trip of a movie we just watched? Acid trip, um, zany comedy. It's a 1987 Academy Award winning film, Inner Space. It's true. Joe Dante's only Academy Award winning film. The only Oscar will ever be close visual to visual effects. I love the practical effects. I thought it worked pretty well. Oh yeah. I'd never seen this at all, ever. So during the big moment when it's alluded to the entire time in the beginning, like 15, 20 minutes, we have no idea what the experiment is. So my notes flat out say like this is some like honey I shrunk the kids meets the fly meets Tron type of stuff like what's going on here like i was completely glued because i had no idea what was about to happen to uh our hero dennis quaid you didn't know it was about shrinking i had no idea i mean like it's it's not a wholly original thing but i think it becomes no. a an original thing because it's yeah fantastic it's 1966's voyage. fantastic voyage <laughs> right just with more wacky zany joe dante energy yeah i heard it it was pitched to Joe, like, or Joe had the idea of, like, what if Dean Martin was injected into Jerry Lee Lewis? Like, and, like, that's our concept. Wait, Jerry Lee Lewis? Or Jerry, isn't that his name? Great Balls of Fire? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Nothing Lewis. Lewis. <laughs> the original Nutty Professor. I mean, Martin Short is essentially the the jerry lewis of the 80s <clears throat> yeah you can see like that's oh yeah that concept fits perfectly with i mean it means it shows why they casted someone like Mar- martin short with the physical and kind of zany chops that jerry lewis jerry not lee lewis <laughs> <has>. <laughs> the killer himself jerry <clears throat> lewis um i remember as a kid that this was a lot more of Dennis Quaid in action. And then watching this, it's no, he is passive the entire film of just kind of like, they have maybe a minute of scenes together. It's yeah. Martin Short's film. Right. Absolutely. I kind of laughed because at about halfway through, I felt like, man, this must have been the easiest paycheck. It's just Dennis sitting this little cubby thing and just kind of jump around like you're the penguin in Batman Returns that hasn't been made yet at this point and just like jump around and just react to nothing. I mean, he, he found time to meet and marry Meg Ryan because of this movie. And they produced uh, Jack Quaid together. <laughs> they produced, they executive time. produced Jack Quaid. 
Um, you say it's easy, but I would argue this is probably actors probably don't like doing this so much, like just being alone. And like, I, I know Sir Ian McKellen kind of had a breakdown when he was doing <laughs> The Hobbit because he was. It, it was it was pretty emotionally distressing for him, and I I definitely understand that because it's you're surrounded by green screens. You're supposed to be acting with nine other men in that room, and nobody is present. The only people there is just him in front of the camera, and it was very tough for him to do. And I can kind of get that, but at least in this, I mean, he was in his own yeah you know, like cockpit. I mean, he got like buttons to flip, and it's just like just gotta grab the mic. Jack, Jack, are you hear me? Do you hear me, Jack? Jack. <laughs> It's got to be tough, though, having nobody to necessarily play against because, yeah, the editing, it works back and forth of like Jack and then Tuck and Jack and Tuck. And then all of a sudden it's just Tuck sitting in a room by himself, just recording lines into a camera, um, which I mean, the same part, at least Martin Short gets to interact with people, but it's the same thing of him mostly just saying recited lines with somebody probably off screen just chiming in of uh, all of Dennis Quaid stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, at least the difference between this and Gandalf and The Hobbit is um, there's not supposed Only to be... one was written by J. R. <laughs> oh, no, good. <laughs> there's not supposed to be anybody there. Like, if, if, if he was really inside his body, there'd be nobody there and he would just be hearing a voice and like... So at least in that the situation is real as to the what's the the scene and what's going on whereas Gandalf he has to pretend that there's people there and <laughs> pretend you know now kind of sucks I want to see them accidentally inject Frodo into Gandalf how would he talk to him I think he would just die he'd just drown immediately <laughs> what is is he in a magic maybe it's a magic bubble I don't know it goes directly to his heart and just blows it out <laughs> <laughs> so Dean, when um, did you find this film uh, this is just one of those movies that I remember I had seen. I barely remembered it, but it was like probably a TV slash recorded VHS situation. Um, all I really remembered was like the guy at the end when like the other guy gets injected into the cyst into the fray and then they, they like fight. That's all I remembered kind of happening in this movie. Um, <laughs> oh, it's just the the end body fight thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's a r really I had no attachment to this movie. I was just like, oh yeah, I remember like the effects, like the blood and like like the the micro effect, uh, microscopic like real human effects were pretty good. Which I think it's a lot of fun, like as you said, the the inner body effects, but then. It's all these, at one point, Martin Schoer goes full total recall towards the end of the movie. Right. Uh, that there, there is a lot of wacky effects going on. And none of it ends up looking like, wow, this is dated. It feels more like we are watching a live action Looney Tunes cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, also, um, Dean, I noticed that you just said the fight with the guy at the end of the movie and you didn't mention that it's it's Vernon Wells, Wes from Mad Max 2. Oh, that's who that is on the motorcycle? Also Bennett from Commando. Oh, I don't remember that much. But he, the, he's the guy on the on the bike? Oh, wait, on the... <clears throat> or, he's the guy who gets injected to go after... No, 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 I meant uh, in, uh, Mad, in, in uh, the Road Warrior. He, he's the... Uh, yeah. With the like the mohawk thing. Oh, that's him. I had no idea. I still haven't seen it. He has much better yeah. range than I realized. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, yeah, he's uh, what's his name? Lord Humongo. <laughs> Just walk away. <laughs> then I was like, oh, no, 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 no. He's the other guy. I know I need to see that at some point. I, it's on my bucket list. We'll pick it. It's a fun one for sure. I referred to him at first as. Uh, they hired Jose Canseco to be like a killer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I immediately saw it. I was like, he looks familiar. And I'm like, oh my God, that's Bennett from Commando. When Arnold throws the pipe through him and he's like, lit off some steam, Bennett. And I'm like, oh, he has such like a great personality in Commando of this like kind of crazy, but like the, the opposite side of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then in this, he's just completely silent. Yeah, like that's a... Like 
I felt like, oh, they just cast him because he's he's large and intimidating, which I guess that's all it needed to be, but they yeah. didn't, didn't really let him, <laughs> literally didn't write any dialogue. Apparently, like, we, they, we know he can have some fun with it. Apparently, they had like a Michael J. Fox slash Eric Stoll. They had an Eric Stoll situation where like they shot scenes oh, no. with some other guy. But then they're like, this isn't working. He's the same height and build as Martin Short. So uh, you've got a completely different person. They recast it and <clears throat> and it works. I mean, for what they're going for, it's just, just remind me of Jose Canseco for some reason. Which it's also funny you mentioned it's like the Michael J. Fox, Eric Stoltz situation. Because I guess originally the idea was that it would be Michael J. Fox inside Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I saw that too. Which is a very different movie. That flips the um, tone of the movie, too, because Arnold Schwarzenegger is very different from... Well, I think Arnold <laughs> could Short. do it because like, he, is, he has that funny delivery on a lot of things that is often goes underrated. But it would have been a very different thing of Dennis Quaid, between this and Dreamscape and so many other things, had it locked down in the 80s of like the... The lovable but kind of uh, aloof bit of a smartass. But then you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in there. It's like, no, he Arnold Schwarzenegger is not the Han Solo type that gets put into this machine. <laughs> no. Because then at the end, it would be him and uh, Mr. Igo. And then he bursts out of the machine to fist fight Igo. <laughs> Somehow he doesn't dissolve in stomach acid. <laughs> Jack, your body's weak. <laughs> Joe Dante had said um, that he thought this was the closest movie he has made that was like close to his intention, like what he, they started out making. I always wondered how many times that actually happens. I know I can maybe list like three or four movies that probably the di- director was not fully happy with it. And it's just like, fine, whatever, here. Some directors I know, like, they're pretty happy with the theatrical cut, but when asked to do a director's cut, they have to kind of scrounge the cutting room floor just to add stuff, just to satiate the producers and the studio that are requesting a director's cut, because no, this is it. <laughs> he, I guess it's just a shame they they didn't know how to market it. Um, yeah. And it, like, flopped, I guess. Oh, it was considered it, a flop, even though it made, I don't know how much they spent on marketing, but worldwide it was 40, total like 40 something. Because I think the budget was 27 mil. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So it probably broke even slash maybe lost a little bit of money or but also made, it's like made a it tiny opened bit on 4th of July weekend. And I understand that it's like, it's a holiday weekend, but also it's a holiday weekend that has a lot of people probably outside, outside. and doing cookouts and things, not people piling into a theater. As soon as this opened against Adventures, Adventures and Babysitting. Babysitting. I'm trying which to take like, my job. Also love that. I'm going to eventually pick Adventures and Babysitting. But like, I wouldn't think that. to rush out to a theater you know, on... I... You've never seen Adventures and Babysitting? There's a lot of movies we haven't seen. Oh, I'm going to pick it. It's going to be great. You guys are going to love it. Keep setting that bar too high. It's going to be the greatest <laughs> film of all time. I think pound for pound, sitting down and thinking about it, Joe Dante might be my favorite director. He comes up a lot. I mean, this was the 80s and early 90s were like his golden era. Before Spielberg cast him aside. (laughs) (laughs) Just like a Shang Tsung throwing down a husk. Like Andy dropping Woody. Like, I don't want to play with you anymore. (laughs) He drops Joe Dante's husk to the ground and grabs uh, George Lucas. His soul is mine. Yours will be next. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Have you seen the Gremlin show yet? No. You really should. I should. I I will. Um, at some point, it's just a, a time shuffle situation. Sooner or later, we'll probably hit all of Joe Dante's films because we've already hit Gremlins. We're doing this. I will absolutely choose matinee at some point, do the burbs at some point. Um, between that and the howling and piranha and all this other stuff. I think um, Vernon Wells should just dress like Wes from Mad Max like all the time. Like 
You can't or just beat, so people don't forget. You can't beat that look. <laughs> Can you imagine if he was Mr. Igo in this, dressed like that? <laughs> I said incognito. The second he came on screen, I really was thinking, like, is this some Terminator guy? Like, what is he trying to do I mean, here? it's not far and then, off. And then I was, uh, yeah. I was <laughs> pleasantly surprised. I actually don't have too many notes about this because it's just the movie's all over the place. And... A lot of my notes are just speculative things that are almost the same thing as Mystery Science Theater. And it's just me riffing or commenting on certain things. Please. But throughout the whole of it, it's really just me watching it because it's really all over the place. Every time I think I know where the movie is going. Nope. Nope. It also that doesn't feel as long act, as it is. I felt it. Um, oh. the, the second <laughs> act really threw me through a loop. Or the third act. Because I feel like the whole thing with the cowboy, that entire thing with the cowboy was like, I was not oh, expecting make muckle bones. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Picardo. I think it only seemed shorter because I followed up this movie with watching Avatar 2 last night. So this was like a breeze. And then Lawrence of Arabia the next night. Yeah. Um, this movie stars Dennis Quaid as, I guess he's the main character kind of um yeah but but martin short really goes through the change but i don't know martin short is the I mean, they co-star jack putter the grocery store employee who gets a tiny man injected into his ass <laughs> um meg ryan plays uh dennis quaid's on again off again uh having a rocky relationship girlfriend was a reporter. There's a lot of stuff with their relationship that is just like brushed past, <laughs> yeah. not mentioned again, kind of weird. We'll <laughs> we'll get to all of it yeah. and we'll go through these scenes. <laughs> uh I don't know this Fiona Lewis plays Dr. Margaret Kanker, like a nymphomaniac b- b- scientist. Um <laughs> Vernon Wells aforementioned plays Mr. Igo, the hulking um cyborg no he's not a cyborg but i mean technically part... does he count as a cyborg oh yes if, yeah. just, if you just part if you have he is a cybernetic organism yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah because a cyborg is a human with cybernetic additions an yes. android is a full robot yeah with living tissue robert picardo as the cowboy a mysteriously weird tech dealer who's come to broker a deal for these, these miniaturization miniaturization technology um wendy shawl what have i seen her in did you rec- do you recognize the off burbs. the top of your head oh the burbs yeah 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 she okay. was the wife of um she's Bruce a dante burbs she's a dante yeah. person okay. same case with like robert picardo her um she was the only also- one that caught my eye was dick miller he decided to make his uh presence note in this one tim's favorite actor of all time dick miller is my favorite like if he just shows up in a movie i'm just like there we go he was i mean he was funny in his little part yeah he always is um but i i love joe dante's like stable of actors that he always goes to between like yeah henry gibson and this and also in um small soldiers wendy also wendy shaw people might know her she um, is the voice of Francine, the wife on um, American Dad, as well these days? Oh, but, was, oh, was Wendy oh, yeah. Shaw Bill Hartman's wife in the Small Soldiers? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't recall if she was in Small Soldiers. I remember she was in the Burbs, but she might have been. World War Two was my favorite war. Um, <laughs> you guys remember that? <laughs> but yeah, between that, Henry Gibson. Um, who is the owner or like the manager yeah. of the supermarket right. also played in the burbs. Kevin McCarthy, a scrimshaw also started, well, not started, but um, Joe Dante's first movie Piranha. He was also in that one. So it's like all of these people that end up making a, a comeback. Yeah. She was the wife. Yeah, huh. She was his wife. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, Steven Spielberg presented this, so he he was around during the script stages and tried to get a couple people on. I think he took it, even John Carpenter was 
attached at one point. <laughs> um, John Carpenter's inner space. <clears throat> make him. Does he? I mean, I guess Big Trouble in Little China is is comedic. So I guess yeah, he could yeah, he could have handled. He definitely this has for like sure. comedy chops in him. Yeah. Which actually would work really well because I feel like a Jack Burton is kind of a Tuck Pendleton. Yeah. Of like, yeah, some, you're right. Except I think Tuck is a little bit more self aware. Self aware, also falling apart a little more, I think. Yeah. Um, but they're cut from the Jack same Jack Burton cloth. never got drunk at a party and like <laughs> embarrassed everyone and got into a fist fight in a kitchen. Kathleen Kennedy was a part of it too. And she's oh, one yeah, of Steven right. Spielberg's um, and Frank Marshall. Producers. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis Quaid looks at this and says, it's a dumb, stupid comedy, which is exactly what people need in the summertime. It's very idiotic. And I love it. We encounter every dumb, stupid cliche in the book. Leave your brain at home and you'll have a good time. A rousing review. <laughs> I mean, the plot is bonkers and it, it is like, it's it does just kind of descend into this crazy plot and like kind of just like knows what it's doing but i feel like it's like i get that he's saying it in a sense of don't take it too seriously just have fun it's that kind of movie but it's also it's not a stupid film i've seen stupid films (laughs) i think this one is silly but it's not like hey let's make something just outrageously dumb (laughs) yeah no you're right um, I guess without further ado, let's jump right in. Quest. Let's. No, we're not stealing lines. Opening credits. Uh, microscopic, but real, real film. There's no, there's no computer graphics. I think going on in this movie, uh, in the traditional sense. I think most of it is is practical. There's forced perspective, yeah. and he uh, actually put a Canon XLR into Dennis Quaid. <laughs> <laughs> for the opening um yeah the, the opening is is uh we figure we realize is a a rocks glass filled with ice and it's filled up with uh whiskey or something and it's dennis quaid picking it up you see he's at some kind of uh party honoring young new test pilots and you kind of get the sense that he is like a washed up guy uh that we used to be a crack test pilot the go-to guy and now it's all the younger guys turn and he's jealous of them getting to fly these pretty new white fighter jets they look like nasa but like like if nasa made um combat airplanes well because he mentioned that um which also like we i don't think we mentioned that the the score is jerry goldsmith throughout this movie and the opening credits is like somehow a lot creepier with that score than what the actual movie ends up being. But he mentions with all the the kids of like, you're the, you walked on the moon and you like flew around orbit and you did this. So it's like they're grabbing all of these NASA test pilots and astronauts. I thought they were doing more space stuff. I didn't realize they were using those pilots for their new like jets. Yeah, I mean, he's got a like a navy uniform. It seems so. I don't know. It's like they watched "Honey, I Shrunk the Kids" and "Short Circuit" and combined the two, but they took out all the racism. <laughs> of short, from oh, of, just short circuit. <laughs> just was, short circuit. I mean, just some racism. Trying, just some. But I was not. trying to remember "Honey, I Shrunk the Kids," and I was like, I don't, I don't remember anything in that. <laughs> <laughs> you said short circuit in my head i said battery's not included i'm like where's the racism in that movie i'll have to go back <laughs> and watch that um, the indirect racism because i don't think they did it on purpose <laughs> but dennis quaid is obviously too drunk yeah he has a little speech draws attention to himself and then falls into the models and I just love as he falls, he's like, ah, shit, I spilled my drink all over. But just <laughs> after destroying the whole table. I salute you. Shit, I spilled my drink. Which I wonder if he didn't end up falling through the table, if everybody would have been like, yeah, speech. Because it starts <laughs> off kind of mean, but it ultimately ends with like, 
yeah, my career is over and all of yours is just beginning. All of you great guys. And then he <laughs> falls through and it's, okay, well, <laughs> sure. It was very sarcastic, but I'm sure you could have taken it as he's genuinely celebrating them. If he didn't then engage in a kitchen fist fight after this. <laughs> Had me in the first half. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, so a couple of the guys usher him back into the kitchen. They say, you're an asshole. And drunk Dennis Quaid proves to be a formidable opponent. Um, <laughs> ducks a guy's punch, hits him in the stomach, and then blocks another guy's punch with his uh, with a pan. Um, until his old buddy Pete, I guess who he probably used to work with in some capacity testing airplanes, kind of talks some sense into him or gets him to calm down and. Uh oh yeah, this whole time we see that Meg Ryan is like watching this embarrassed as fuck, and you're probably like, oh, that's his girlfriend. And that's who it ends up being. Lydia. Lydia. We cut and she is they're they're going into Dennis's apartment and he's a mess. Dennis Den I call him Dennis. His name's Tuck. I'm gonna refer to him. If I say Dennis, I mean Tuck. Tuck uh, Always Tuck. Tuck always everlasting, tuck. if you will. Is that does anybody name that's got to be a pretty unique name, Tuck? It's I mean, short they, for Tucker. Oh God damn Maybe. it! Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> but like nobody say, ever the, says the only two. You feel like somebody would say Tucker at some point. The only two I think Tucks so. I know is Tuck Everlasting and Fryer. <laughs> it's just the some names have those like fads where you'll see a thousand of them. Apparently, my name was really popular. I mean, it is, but I mean, it's not in comparison to like some of the other ones where it's just, you know, John num or James number like 50 in the same building kind of thing. Right. Well, I think there's like staple names like John's and Nick's and Joe's. And then there's like the fad names of like, oh, this is trendy right now. <laughs> uh, I was going to say a couple, but I'm like, they're not going to hear this podcast, are they? I won't say anything. I mean, statistically, they probably are. <laughs> Just uh, okay, uh, Braden, um, Riley, Rayley, uh, uh, the L E I G H spellings. That's that's adding, adding that to any any um, any name seems to be popular nowadays. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, Tuck. Tucker. It's kind of interesting to see the relationship here between Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan, knowing that they eventually will get married in real life and also have a child named uh, uh, Jack, who is the main uh, other protagonist in this movie. They Although, named him after Jack from Inner Space. Yeah. Did they really? Jack Quaid. I mean, that's what I'll go with. Jack Quaid's in this movie towards the end. That's true. That is true. <laughs> it's a um, scientific marvel that they managed to do it. But he is the only one to ever meet his son before birth, and not through just the ultrasound. Look him in the eyes. <laughs> that looks nothing like me. I'm going to kick your ass when you come out of here. Um, <laughs> uh so, yeah, we get the, the Tuck is a washed up Navy. Now, I say Navy test pilot because he's got a hat that looks like it's from the Navy. Any mention landing blind on like a aircraft carrier. So uh, he's bumping. Maybe on that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was temporarily blind. He's not even in the Navy and he just lands on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> sir, who the fuck are you, sir? <laughs> um, ROTC. <laughs> you can't park that here. <laughs> He gets Keep out, throws moving. the keys. <laughs> Keep it. Uh, he's bumping uglies with Meg Ryan, who seems to have uh, be over the, these drunk antics. Of well, tux. like it's weird because it's like this very Katy Perry hot and cold situation of she's angry. She brings him back, like reprimands him, complains about him and like his actions and all of that. Then he turns on their song, which is like Twisting the Night Away by Sam Cooke. And then they're together that night and then snaps to like the next morning of like, you should have read my note. I'm leaving you. When did you write the <laughs> note after you guys like <laughs> did the deed? I left you very clear instructions on your refrigerator. Honey, that's what you were writing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So he chases her outside the next morning. Uh, it feels like it's like. 
that's like a cliche for women. Like they're wrapped up in a bed sheet, like running somewhere. But now here it's Dennis Quaid, like wrapping himself in a bed sheet. <laughs> um, she's getting into a cab who was played the cab driver played by Dick Miller, Dick Miller, right? No, wait, Dick Miller, Dick Miller. Yeah. The cab was played by Dick Miller. <laughs> <laughs> like who framed Roger Rabbit? <laughs> Where can I take you? There's no driver. The car just talks. <laughs> He's like snooping or just being nosy into their commenting on their their uh, breakup. Good, nice clean break. Leave everything behind. I don't live here. A oh, one nighter. Will, will you, you shut, shut up? up? Get back just in your cab, up. will you? Uh, Tuck tries the old "Oh, my toe is broken" maneuver to pull <laughs> oh, out the strings. <laughs> is that an oldie but a goodie? <laughs> she gets in the cab and he's like, "Oh, look, I stubbed my toe running out. I need you." It's like, that's a really last-ditch effort, huh? She grabs his ankle. Drive! <laughs> and, uh... Oh, just the, the other cliche. The, he's really close to the car door wrapped in his towel. So when she slams on the door, he doesn't know it. But as the car drives off, it pulls the towel with the car. And he's just left stranded in the middle of the road naked. And I guess, yeah, he just... He's not drunk anymore, but he doesn't try to cover up. He's just like, he's like, hands are up, like, come back. He's just like his buck ass <laughs> naked. He knows what he's about. He's Dennis <laughs> Quaid in the 80s. Just from behind, you see him start helicoptering. You're like, you just, come back. <laughs> <laughs> he slowly lifts off the ground and follows. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do this much for you, babe. Don't leave. <laughs> um, Wow, Dennis really was right. Just shut your brain off and enjoy it. <laughs> uh, and then we cut to two months later in Silicon Valley. Yeah, right. I love this doctor. I know the doctor I thought was really funny to me. So eventually when I make you watch Matinee, there is a film within a film. And William Schaller, who plays the doctor in this, is in the fake film called Mant where he is like the doctor who is doing scientific tests to turn a man into an ant or whatever the case was. So if you liked him in this, you will love him in Matinee. I got to see Matinee. And we're introduced to this doctor. Well, really, we're introduced to Martin Short, who plays Jack Putter. He's a baby in this. Putter? I forgot how young he is when he, he does seem pretty that. young and pretty youthful. Impressionable. Impressionable. But you get a sense that he's a hypochondriac because the doctor's like, Jack, listen, your regular office visits are the cornerstone of my entire medical practice. The doctor doesn't seem to take anything he says seriously, I guess, because it seems like, yeah, he goes, he's in there all the time complaining about something. Um, it's a bit like Ed Grimley going to the doctor, like with the physical humor here, like the falling off the, like there's not that much like Pratt falling or anything in this movie. So it's interesting that they had like these like whoop de whoop falls and stuff in this scene. <laughs> As a kid, like I've never, I had never seen the entire movie beginning to end. My parents were never Martin Short fans, so we never like watched <laughs> things as a family. So it was always just I happened to catch it on Comedy Central, like bit by bit. And I, for some reason, remembered a lot more of just Martin Short unhinged, like in the first third of this movie, of just like doing prat falls and freaking out and running through things, and then watching it, it's like. No, it, it's a little bit of that, but then it kind of turns into more of just like a a buddy action adventure thing. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely zany, I guess, quote unquote things, but it's like, yeah, it's not to that level of just like, there's physical comedy, but there's a difference between that and just <laughs> this isn't falling down. This is Martin and, Short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which can be really polarizing, but uh, I find that movie funny. Um, anyway. <laughs> You would. <laughs> that was a fever dream of a movie of five hours long. I actually watched it a couple of years ago again because I swear to God, I felt I was the only person who had ever seen it. I've got to pick. I remember it. going to the theaters and see it, and it was just fucking weird. It's a weird movie. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird movie. I used to confuse it with Problem Child, and then I sat down to watch Problem Child. And I'm like, I have no idea what I was expecting here. <laughs> Where's the dinosaur, Clifford? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So he. Uh, that just sets up kind of Jack as like a neurotic kind of, um, <laughs> he's describing this nightmare that he has, um, about he's, he works at a grocery store. So he describes a nightmare with this redheaded woman 
He's scanning her stuff at the checkout, and it's all ridiculously high prices. And it's just like stressing him out. And she pulls out a little gun, and I was like, snub nose. Um, it's not a revolver, <laughs> but um, it's like a one shot, I think. It's like a Derringer. <laughs> and like goes to shoot him, and that's his nightmare, which is important, I guess, because it weirdly happens later on in the movie. But we cut and we see. Pete from earlier in the movie who kind of settled down Tuck in the kitchen talking to some guy who we realize is like a project head for this miniaturization that we realize later is a miniaturization project. He's like, who's your po- test pilot? This is, now granted, this is two months after this incident at the party where he embarrassed himself. He's like, yeah, it's Tuck Pendleton. And Pete's like, shit. Um, apparently he was <laughs> like the, only- the guy from The Wire? <laughs> yeah, he's like, She. she- <laughs> He say he's the only guy crazy enough to uh, try to to test pilot this for us, so that's why he was selected. And then we see, and that cuts right to like Tuck is getting ready. It's like a really long loading process. Like it starts with him slapping his face in the mirror, like trying to talk himself up, which is a really like I get trying to psych himself up, but he just seems crazy. Yeah, and I think oh, well, like maybe he's just strung out because he's usually like he's. <laughs> All an alcoholic, and then later in the movie, he's like dead sober doing it, and you're like, "Oh, he's just weird." <laughs> How does that feel? Feels good. Then do it again. I love the scientist, like the head scientist here. Like he just seems very scatterbrained, like aloof. Like you know, props to this movie for not once ever repeating the line in English, please. <laughs> Because there's that whole five minute sequence of him explaining what they're doing, and he's just unfiltered, pure techno babble. The the whole entire scene of him just walking around and just kind of like getting ready and just like <laughs> looking at things and taking a picture. He kisses and the woman. That, yeah, and like yeah. The, that Jerry Goldsmith score is going, and then you have the scientist just explaining for like the video cameras of how things are working. It's a great way to just drop a bit of exposition, but it just feels so like I know it's not a he's only a producer, but it feels very like Spielbergian of just like that kind of weird nostalgia score of, oh, he's the the hero who's about to return. Yeah, no, I see what you mean there. That then slaps himself in the face. <laughs> this is who we hired. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get over like. Uh, he kisses that woman. I was like, "Are they together?" Like he just gets like goes up and like romantically kisses some, a woman. There. At the end of the movie, they like enlarge him again, and they immediately slap cuffs on. They're like, "Ah, uh, <laughs> she pressed charges." <laughs> Tuck. Sorry, man, you're tucked. I thought there was going to be more of a setup. Like the that same woman sits down at this computer and the head scientist leans over like, hey, uh, I, I spilled coffee in this computer last week. It's not reliable. Just be careful. I thought it was going to like fuck something up <laughs> late, like it was planting something, but it's like, no, it's just a line they threw in. <laughs> well, um, and then there's the other thing of the guy as they're like using the machine to slowly like take the robot hand and put the chips in so they're able to like <laughs> use it. And then as he's doing it, he's just like looking at paperwork this was supposed to be in like days ago. You didn't turn this in. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other paperwork? Is there any other yeah. paperwork that's supposed to go in? <laughs> and I thought it was going to be like, oh, because they forgot the paperwork. And it's nope. It's just <laughs> another thing that's yeah, just, it's just it's like just... It, it's it, it it weirdly makes it feel real. Like instead of like some, it feels yeah. like real people instead of like these are like the most advanced, serious scientists in the world, which is funny because it's so unrealistic. They. It's a different kind of spinning. I wonder if there's like G. Do you get a lot of G forces spinning in place? Like, because they so the 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 craft they load Dennis they load Tuck into the craft, and yada yada. Whenever they, they get things going, it just goes into this crazy spinning cycle. But it's spinning on the center. It's axis. It's, it's, its own axis. It's not like those tests you'd see NASA guys going through, where it's you're like spinning like a clock at the end of a clock hand. I wonder what it would be like to spin that fast. Because he's like losing sure his it, mind in there. He's like passing out. Well, I'm sure out. his inner ear balance is completely <laughs> destroyed with how fast <laughs> this thing starts spinning. It's a really off topic, but did you ever... This is terrible, but did you see that video 
uh, that person that got rescued and airlifted and the, the cord got like wound up, like somehow got extremely wound up. So this person's getting airlifted and it's just, it's so funny, but terrible. If you think about the person, like they're being lifted and they're spinning at like an insane. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Like they're just like That's like him in terrible. this movie spinning. <laughs> like sp- <laughs> you should go and look it up. It's like they ridiculous. finally get them up to the helicopter and they're miniature. <laughs> anyway, I just you gotta watch that. Yeah, so they activate this process. He's suddenly small, and I think they imply that he gets sucked into like this air duct system and then put into a syringe with, I guess, water. And zooms in and we see there's tiny little Tuck Pendleton and his craft in this uh, syringe of water. And that is when we see some people coming into the reception area of this lab. Die Hard style. What do they say they're here to do? Um, check the phone lines or something? Kick ass and chew bubblegum? <laughs> oh, that I'm was to... John Carpenter's inner space. <laughs> I'm here to spray people in the face with some kind of toxin and chew bubblegum. <laughs> and I'm all So uh, casually. Gum. <laughs> I, there's so I, many points where i'm just like oh huh it's just just like that is it <laughs> yeah they put on this fake story but it's it's really just 30 seconds later it's just surprise like pocket spray like he pulls up it's almost like, it's a like hair. an aerosol can yeah, an aerosol yeah. can and just sprays something i and love it, the, the, the guy's like passes out instantly <laughs> it's, it's literally <laughs> like if there was a punch in that can because he just sprays it it's just like Ooh, and he just goes out <laughs> and then they like storm the main lab room and they're just all of them are just spraying it's and just, everybody's just doing, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> why do they keep walking towards them why do you need small controlled bursts <clears throat> just do one across the room <laughs> there, there, there. <laughs> yeah i guess that's eventually turns out that's margaret dr margaret what's her uh, canker the- thatcher <laughs> The uh, iron later herself. <laughs> what a Tarantino turn of events. Um, <laughs> yeah, they come in, spray fucking everybody. It must be the order. Like, spray with reckless abandon. Everybody's going down. I loved this <laughs> so much. I was just thinking, like, man, I would love to have that at work. Hey, Nick, can you do it? Shh. <laughs> hey, Nick, someone needs that. Shh. <laughs> And you just go down. I I would love to have that spray. Like, I mean, it's a gun. It's not shooting bullets, but it's definitely shooting something. I would want it, but I would face it the other way. Hey, Tim, can you shh? And I go down. <laughs> okay, I'll come back Give later. Give him the satisfaction. <laughs> uh, he's sleeping again. We were introduced to Mr. Igo, huge man. The doctor, they find the doctor, they like kind of unkempt unorganized doctor who's been hiding and he eyeballs the syringe sitting there he eyeballs it and and bolts with the syringe so they must think oh that's we need that that's important so they chase him mr igo chases him into a perfectly 80s mall aesthetic yeah (laughs) this is a really long chase sequence here that goes down to like the la river kind of situation i'm impressed with how good he is on that bike yeah the doc has some athletic moves jumping fences like dodging the car he steals the dog's bike and the dog barks at him um (laughs) it goes up a ramp he like flips it (laughs) under his legs tail whip (laughs) it's like matt hoffman pro bmx (laughs) goldfinger starts to play as he's just taken off down the street (laughs) meanwhile it's intercut with um Shots of Dennis Quaid, who's in the syringe in his pocket, being jostled around. He's confused because nobody's talking to him. He has no communication. I like how he thinks they're just pulling a prank on him. (laughs) Come on, Ozzy. What are you doing? What are you doing to me? (laughs) Hey, your life is in danger. Let's just fuck around with you. And I like the coy little Easter egg because as uh, Ozzy pulls into the shopping mall, so does Mr. Igo. And on the uh, license plate, it's a cosmetic or a vanity one. It just says snap on. Mm. And I didn't realize it until as I'm watching the movie, oh. as you're describing it. It's like, oh, I'm like, I, I saw the, the vanity plate and like the, the hell is this supposed to mean? And now watching it that second time, I realized it's because he's got a little extra, a couple of things up his sleeve. Yeah. 
That's Snap On. <laughs> so he chases him into a mall, eventually catches up to him and just raises his hand and points his finger. And he's got finger guns. Just like the original finger gun. <laughs> original <laughs> finger gun. Um I forget. I guess the doctor had grabbed a balloon or something. Or though the balloon's just He grabbed near a him. kid and moved grabbed him in front kid. as a shield. Right, right, right. So <laughs> <laughs> Once he saw the gun, then he grabbed the kid, moved the kid in front of him as a shield. Um, Take him, not me. <laughs> no, but he's he doesn't see Mister Igo, who's shoots with his finger cannon, which I guess is pretty uh, unassuming. But he nails him right in the gut, pops the balloon. The doctor stumbles into a an elevator, uh, and kind of intercut with this, we see Jack Martin Short is. Oh, yeah, that's right. The doctor recommended, like, you need relaxation. That's, like, what he was prescribing him. Like, you're fine. Like, just just take it easy. So he's at the mall at a travel agency, and he's leaving. And that's when the elevator, elevator doors open up. The doctor stumbles out, and I guess just in a last... He's, like, dying. He's bleeding out. I guess in a last-ditch effort, he's like, well, I'm going to inject Dennis Quaid into this guy, and... Chat. He like kind of stumbles forward, <laughs> reaches around and pokes the syringe in his butt cheek, and in goes Tuck. He stumbles, puts it directly into his heart. <laughs> There's one thing I wanted to um, mention because yes. I thought it was a cool little um, thing because of the age of this movie. When Mister Igo shoots, he looks at a kid that happens to have seen the whole thing, who's holding a toy gun, and he, you know blows the smoke from his oh, finger yeah, right, as if right. it's some cool thing. The little kid's holding a toy gun and it does not have an orange cap on it. And I thought that was really interesting mm. because at a certain point, it had become illegal for all toy guns to be sold without an orange cap. Any toy gun you purchase now, they all have them regardless of what kind of gun it is. Right. If it's electronic, if it actually shoots something, it needs to have that orange cap. And then it reminded me of an episode of one of those toy collecting shows. I think it was um, the one from Jay and Silent Bob Secret Stash, mm. that one. Apparently now, because of that law going into effect, the original Megatron toy was Megatron transforming into a gun. That gun does not have the orange cap, making it illegal to sell and trade. It's a little interesting little tidbit. But it was just cool to see an actual toy gun out in like the wild like this without that cap because it's so normalized now to see it wherever you go. Maybe he had a real gun in the mall. A little tiny M16. I go casually, looks over, sees the kid, and he's like... <gasps> <laughs> kid just levels it on him. Have you seen this bad? I go should have had a little orange cap on the end of his glove. <laughs> this is where um, Ozzy finally collapses, and then he's rescued by the creepiest looking mall um, people dressed in like animal costumes. That <laughs> this mall's got everything. This is the stuff out of nightmares. Like they would hire these guys to scare the <laughs> shit out of the Five Nights at Freddy's animatronics. Like these are these are tough. An 80s mall with nuns, clowns, balloons, furries, everything. Man, I was born in the wrong time. <laughs> These are like David Fincher's furries. Like, it's, it's holy shit. <laughs> and you realize um, as uh, Igo makes off with the doc, he just gets off on ruining people's days. Well, I, I like the guy with the camera that's like taking the picture. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he just does the quickest, <laughs> swiftest kidney punch and just is like, sock. Takes and then the just camera. takes the guy out. Later, we find out that guy is the best, most fastest working photographer with the greatest intuition that's ever known. <laughs> um, on, on. I have sight beyond sight. His <laughs> eyes are pure white. I've been here for days. He gets the details that everybody needs. Um, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Dennis is just passed out inside Martin Short, who realizes he is late for work. He gets to the grocery store where he works. Tuck is waking up, realizing he's swimming around in the fat, which I guess is his ass fat. Um, but he thinks he's in the bunny at this point. He doesn't know that he's in a person. Um, I wrote, oh, that lady. It's Jack's co-worker. It's Shaw. It's Wendy Shaw. Wendy Shaw. Um, Henry Gibson. She plays just kind of a 
uh, his mean co-worker. I hate to shock you, but we had a date last night. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You forgot? How could you forget? Jack, look, I've already told you. If you want to be a part of my life, you can't be hassling me about stuff. <laughs> then uh, Jack, the suddenly his nightmare starts to come true that he was describing to the doctor. Um, a redheaded woman comes through the line and he like kind of gasps and starts ringing her stuff up and it's all ringing up to like $128,000. Oh, because so the, the electromagnetic field from um tuck's machine inside of him is like oh that's what did it oh yeah, right because he that's was doing right. the electric pulse to try to like that's right um elicit a response and it just kept hiking it up also the the woman you might know is kathleen freeman from a thousand things she did look familiar um but she was the teacher in hocus pocus Ah, uh, I mean, she was also in like Gremlins too. She also did voices in Little Nemo, Dangers in Slumberland. She's like, she's everywhere. Yeah. But, when Dante makes a movie, he's like, bring my Rolodex. Just call everybody on it. They're all getting roles. <laughs> Take Dick Miller out of cryo storage. <laughs> Cut to yeah, like Demolition scene, I was, Man. I didn't put the two and two together. Why the prices went up when a full week's worth a full month's worth of groceries probably cost 50 bucks back then yeah so to get a price tag of a hundred thousand dollars and more it's like what the hell did you ring up i like how casual she is about it because it's just like she's watching it and she's just like hey that's kind of pricey for shampoo ain't it listen sweetie i don't carry that kind of cash around with me What's that line from Independence Day? Like, you really didn't think they spent $30,000 on a hammer, $50,000 on a toilet seat, do you? <laughs> I guess that this this is where they shop for those items. <laughs> I don't carry that cash. Credit cards, you got it. The nightmare playing out pretty much exactly as he described also suggests weirdly that like he's clairvoyant somehow. It's a pretty <laughs> big be. coincidence. He could be. Uh, she pulls out the gun, like he, he anticipates the gun because that's the kicker to his nightmare, but it's a, just turns out to be a lighter and that's the gotcha gag. And he starts freaking out. Also, when could you smoke in supermarkets? Cause I mean, she just you like smoke everywhere. The really? same, the same time where you could smoke in shopping malls. Hospitals. And, uh... <laughs> True. Planes, submarines. You, you first see like the blood effects here cause his heart starts, like he starts to get anxious and like that's where i thought like oh this looks really cool just like made of jello or some rubber or something but the, i don't know how i would love to have seen how they shot some of this like, i think it was gelatin stuff. that they used yeah because it looks it looks pretty pretty cool in, in my opinion i know we'll never get practical effects like that ever again but there's just something different about it that's just it looks real uh, yeah it looks real, real. Like, it looks like you have you yeah. shrunk that's somebody's blood like it just looks I know the proportions I mean, are probably not correct, but it's still just with looks everything much that more we realistic. do with like CGI and special effects in terms of that, there really is nothing that you can do to replace good old fashioned miniature and real prop work. And yeah. it's sad uh, to see how, you know, this entire magic school bus adventure would just be another CGI thing with people shot in front of green screens. I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised if this was remade today that, Dennis Quaid's replacement would just be in an entire little thing completely made out of green screen, you know? Right. Yeah, like a keyboard in front of him, all the rest of it just like green screen work. <laughs> all the windows are green screen, everything in there is green screen, and he's just, yeah, it just doesn't have that same kind of feel. Having those old-fashioned 80s special effects really does have a better place in media that it just... It, feel it looks so much better there's something like tan well, i mean there is something tangible to it it's practical but like it's it gives that different look like i know i mentioned earlier like i watched avatar 2 last night amazing cgi work great motion capture but still it's like it looks fake it looks fake it's like i understand that there's things that you can never actually do in real life so they have to do it in like and imagine it in cgi but there's something that's just great well, about the practical effects. Yeah. The, and they're choosing the last one I really do feel was the best example of CGI because there were a couple shots in there that it's just like this is the realest thing that I've seen yet. But it's still 
the second if it's in its own scene with one another and a hundred percent of the shot is cgi it kind of works and it has that fake sense of realism to it but the second something real walks into that frame that's where you lose it especially things that do exist in the world look usually just look don't look great because we know what a real one looks like we've all watched discovery channel growing up and national geographic like and the Lion King was the weirdest movie I'd ever seen <laughs> because yeah. I really don't, I never looked at the behind the scenes and I feel I should because it's a live action movie, but it's not. And that whole thing is so weird to watch when you know what a lion looks like, you know what a, a hyena looks like, you know what a, a warthog looks like and you're seeing all of these things. But did you guys see the little mermaid yet? No, yeah. I haven't watched that. Because that was my biggest critique, too. Because apparently, like, Flounder, Sebastian, and still shots, they look weird as hell because they're talking sea creatures. But when they're doing their sea creature things, like swimming and just doing non-human things, like not talking, it looks real enough. But it's still weird to me that they would go that far to CGI so many different things. I don't know. Yeah, I guess things are cheaper to do. It's weird to me, just like because I feel like you see the list of people, and it's like there's there's 800 people that made this movie. Like, how is it cheaper? But I guess it's well, just yeah, they only pay them a comes, dollar, though. Yeah, right. That's about, that's what it is. It's cheap labor. Um, yeah. So because pay of, all of your effects crews appropriately, and also pay for practical effects. Yeah, practical effects. I guess the cost comes because it's. You're creating real tangible things. They have hard costs. Whereas the computer can make anything. You're just paying somebody an hourly rate. Which is uh, not what they deserve. Capitalism at its finest. Coming um, this Friday. But yeah, that blood looks great. Show me more of that blood. I want to see I want to see another inside the human body like this. Made like this. It would be pretty cool. I like his freak out. And that he needs aspirin. And so she gives him the bottle and he like chews it open and just starts pouring it in. And then the woman was like, I'm not buying that aspirin. And then the guy in the back who's like, well, of course not at $800 a bottle. That's Chuck Jones. Again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The guy in the construction hat. Yeah. <laughs> there's lots of there's like lots of jokes just peppered throughout. Like there's lots of lines that just made me laugh. Um, I didn't even catch that one. But I just rewatched it after you said something. Yeah, I didn't either. So his boss takes him back into the office to calm down. Meanwhile, Dennis Quaid is like configuring his computers, scanning like where I don't need to go. He's looking for the eye so he can get some, so he can see what's going on. So I guess that's part of the plan is to link up with the rabbit's eye, but now it's going to be human uh, Jack's eye. This took me out a little bit because I thought it was just like, seriously, man, you've been practicing <laughs> inside of a rabbit for ages. And... The length of my arm is longer than that rabbit. Wouldn't have been kind of like a red flag. Like, man, going up the jugular artery is taking a lot longer than it normally is. Well, he hasn't been. This is the first time actually doing it, though. So yeah, I can't really give him too much credit. He's kind of a drunk. I wouldn't expect him to understand the basics of human anatomy versus that of a rabbit. He's drunk during all his training. Tuck, I need your help. The liquor is calling the shots now, Jack. <laughs> Diagram scrolling past. It's like, that looks like a penis, but uh, I'm just... Gonna assume that's a mistake. This is a rabbit with human teeth. <laughs> the manager's talking to Jack. He's like, You got a great future ahead of you in retail food marketing. I just hate to see you throw it all away by going psycho on us. <laughs> <laughs> I like as he's like getting ready to access the optic nerve so he can see through, you just see him and he's just like cutting through. Like walls and things like that inside <laughs> yeah. his body and just like ramming through. I have no idea the amount of damage that he's doing internally to Martin Short. I the effects are so good. I was like, I was anticipating. I was expecting I was like, oh, a blood clot. Yeah, they're going to show platelets come and start forming behind the cut. I was like, no, the blood just like passes by. I guess it's it's almost like a pothole on the road. It's like his it's going so fast that just goes through. It just doesn't even see that there's. Like we find a out that there. like. This was all beneficial because they found out that Martin Short can't clot. <laughs> uh, you have a lot of tiny bleeds inside your body right now. He's hemorrhaging. Your entire chest cavity is full of blood. 
Yeah, so uh, Tuck finally launches whatever optic monitoring device at his eyeball and, and nerve, causing him to freak out. And uh, of course, the coworkers think he's going crazy. But uh, now that Jack can see, he sees... I love his little sequence of lines. He's like, I'm in a man. I'm in a strange man. I'll be a son of a bitch. I'm in a strange man, surrounded by strangers in a strange room. Yeah, it finally hits him that he didn't get into a rabbit. He somehow got into a dude, and he's not in the lab anymore. Welp, and then he hits the self-destruct. <laughs> <laughs> I was told to take this capsule and destroy all knowledge. Let me find the asshole and get out of here. <laughs> uh, yeah, they think he's going. Jack's going off the deep end. Then we cut. This is a brief scene. We see Dr. Kanker. I forget what she's, she's, they've got the dying. Is the dying doctor there? Well, the, the doctor I thought was. Oh, dead. they're looking, they they're watching the, a video of him. The video that they recorded earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And she's looking at the photo, the amazing photographs that random guy <laughs> in the mall took of this incident where Martin Short is getting stabbed in the butt with a, a <laughs> syringe. And he like, it's yeah. so quick on the draw. <laughs> Enhance. <laughs> like, it took me a second. I was like, okay, I will use my knowledge of inferring information that, okay, he didn't take these close-up photos. They probably they probably zoomed in and blew up, blew them up. But it just makes it look like that guy took a close-up picture of a syringe going in, of his <laughs> name tag on his <laughs> jacket. Like, it's just like all these details. What can I say? He's got like, a nose for those. news. <laughs> He's just got one of those, like, he's like one of those street voyeurs, and he's just, he's really into name tags, and he's just super <laughs> zooming on that. This is the best day of my life when he's looking at the camera back, tags. and it's just all pictures of feet, and they're like, this guy was weird. We should probably. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, I knew a podiatrist that helped me identify Martin Short based on his foot. <laughs> oh, he's got inserts. I prescribed those. Um, <laughs> so we cut and see Dennis Quaid's making his way towards um, the wait is that is he's going towards the ear this this whole time he's trying to figure out a way to understand what's going on so he realizes that oh let me put in like this device thing into his ear so that I can talk to him and he'll at least be able to hear me but it's at that same exact time when um, the doc is using that like ear steth- stethoscope thing, microscope, whatever that puts right. it in his ear to see what's going on. That's when a uh, tuck gets blinded by yeah, na- the light that comes naturally from it. Jack, he's experiencing pain. Uh, so he goes right to the doctor cause he's a hypochondriac, but in this case he's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's in, he's in the elevator and all of a sudden starts hearing Tucker talk to him. It's kind of, it's a funny visual of him just freaking out. There was nobody in Jack's life that loved him enough or cared enough (laughs) to get him the help he needed when all of this started. Otherwise it would have been like, uh, he is in a hospital under observation (laughs) and Tuck just ends up like dying inside of him. (laughs) You're right. Worked out very well. We're just going to pump you full of (laughs) antipsychotics. I love how the doctor's first prognosis you're hearing voices you're talking about god <laughs> this must be some kind of like theistic hallucin- like yeah. hallucination like theistic hysteria even the way that's like well there's only one remedy for that uh, how do you treat that well the uh, medieval remedy was to flay the skin off your body with brands of fire <laughs> <laughs> what uh. Well, and then the scene like, cuts. <laughs> well, in the waiting room when he is hearing it, and like Joe Flaherty and Andrea Martin are sitting on either side of him. Somebody help me! I'm possessed! And then the doctor walks in and is like, well, the good thing is I could rule out demonic possession, mainly because they talk through you, not to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love the doctor. I have that line written down. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's ex- his exact character in Mant. He's like... He seems to actually care on one hand. He just like thinks Jack is full of shit. So he's just really funny. He's the problem with health care. <laughs> just the tip of the iceberg. Um, yeah. So yeah, Doc looks in as Nick mentioned, like blinds Dennis Quaid, who's in the ear still. 
Jack goes home and just starts to ignore Tucker talking to him. Turns on the TV. I can see! Oh, thank God, I can see! Jack? He knows my name. Jack? Jack, we have to talk. No! Jack, we have ourselves a little problem here. I wonder what's on the television. TV is so much fun around now. Jack, pay attention. Oh, good. This is a good one. This this killed me, because it's like the opposite effect of... There's a killer in the house. He's a werewolf. Please send all the cops that you have. And then, of course, like the cops are like, yeah, whatever, buddy. You're in a dude's body. Why aren't you being a little more specific and direct yeah. on what's going on? Because you're literally feeding into this guy thinking that he is possessed. Right. right. <laughs> I would have just like not stopped talking. Like <laughs> just like start explaining it right off the bat. Yeah, he never did. He's just like, Jack. Jack, you need to do this. Jack, you need to do that. Listen to me. Listen to me. Like, dude, come on. Like, come on. Yeah. Or every time he's like, Jack, I'm real, Jack. Jack, I'm real inside of you. And it's like, okay, bud, you can just be I'm like, listen, you. this is going to sound crazy, but did somebody inject you with something? Because it was probably me. Yeah. So they, of course, just write it like <laughs> Not that. Not me injecting you, but I was the injection. You know, it's let me go back to the beginning. <laughs> so there's this rabbit, see? You, you might want to sit down. Um, they get to that point, but it's like, yeah, come on. I know they just wrote it like that to set up all this comedic stuff going on. Um, I wonder what kind of exhaust that thing puts out. Like what is, what kind of shit is he leaving all <laughs> throughout his body? <laughs> like poison. At the end of everywhere. the movie, his doctor comes back. So Jack, I've got some bad news. <laughs> Those scans came back. <laughs> it looks like that little submarine was made entirely of asbestos. <laughs> Your entire cellular structure has been replaced by cancer. I don't know how you're still alive. You or a loved one may have mesothelioma. <laughs> have you ever been injected with a tiny man in a, <laughs> in a ship? Is this all those you? sound bites from Jason Frakes on or Jonathan Frakes on that uh, Ripley's Believer or not? <laughs> Do you remember the tallest man you've ever seen? Have you ever slept in a graveyard? Do you believe in the power of a curse? Ever gone mountain biking? What do you want to be when you grow up? What's the right tip? Have you called a plumber to your home lately? How superstitious are you? Would you display this as a trophy? Do you have a pet? Do you have a sweet tooth? Do you believe in the power of a curse? Have you had your hearing tested lately? Have you ever seen a grown man naked? <laughs> anyway. Tucker, um, he finally starts to get through to him and uh, explains the situation. A guy is knocking on the door. He's delivering cruise tickets which checks out because he was at a travel agency earlier but then the guy invites himself in asks to use the phone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is a bit weird i mean like i know ups has been getting pretty fast and loose these days but i've never had them invite themselves in <laughs> sit down and start using my phone Just took his shoes off you got any milk um <laughs> so Go this get some <laughs> This guy's uh, attitude sets off an alarm with Tucker, who's like, I don't trust him. Like, get out of there. He does try to leave, and that's when the delivery driver pulls a gun. And just... Jack does warn him, too, like, hey, he's not real. He's not <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm real. saying. He's like, I don't trust this guy. <laughs> well, he's not a real delivery... He's not real. I'm real, though. <laughs> I'm inside of you. He's not real. <laughs> Kill him, Jack. Yeah, so while Jack is um, trying to ward off his attacker, meanwhile, his escalated heart rate is causing Dennis right. Quaid's little ship to plunge into his heart. Yeah, that sets up a kind of a double... Um, two dangers here with uh, him struggling with the, the gun with the... Well, presumably, this guy works for the, the bad people that we saw earlier. And uh, meanwhile, Tucker's being pulled towards the heart which his computer's like that's not good like don't go in there probably gonna crush him to death or whatever one this is one of the few movies i'm actually surprised about where you know <clears throat> tuck tells jack get to this address and tell them what happened and he does there's no <laughs> nothing stops him the enemy doesn't intercept him and causes a huge other chase he gets to the research lab where they held that experiment and he actually explains what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it gets you to a different um, 
they didn't have to do that trope. Yeah, like you're saying. Like, it is kind of refreshing, I guess, even though it's an older movie. Yeah, I mean, I guess you just, you took us there. <laughs> so, they go to the lab. He, Jack is explaining everything to them, like, what happened? Like, Jack's inside me, and it's like, yes, they believe him, and it's like, okay, here's the plan. They realize, I guess the other chip is in the ship, which is needed to enlarge and for the whole technology, so... How did they intend to get that out originally? That's what or I'm just. That's what just hit me. Be a case of like, oh, just go up to well, the mouth or something. They, and tear they ex- doctor. Oh, to get him out. Yeah, I thought you meant like, how was it supposed to get the chip out? But yeah, no, I, I don't get it. Oh, and did they? The oh, way, they took the chip, didn't they? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there's two chips. That's so the thing. Chuck, yeah, the Chuck bad guys one. took the chip. That's right. Yeah, so they can't enlarge them. Yeah, because they need one to shrink, but two to re-enlarge. That makes sense now. Okay. Yeah, and, and they the, don't have a backup. The, um, the <laughs> extraction that was a good idea. didn't make sense to me because at the end of the movie, not to warp ahead, just the way that they did it was seemed so careless. You know, I mean, it was barely unplanned. <laughs> <laughs> like you got to sneeze. It's just you're gonna you're not gonna like sneeze into something. And everyone's just watching him like getting ready. Like, how are you gonna? How are yeah, you gonna get- I I I was trying to remember because this scene when it started to happen, I was like, oh yeah, he sneezes him out, and I thought he picked up the card that it ends up being on it was um i was expecting that gag like whenever somebody's choking they do the heimlich the thing shoots out of the guy's mouth it goes into someone else's mouth they start choking <laughs> so he sneezes into that guy's face and he goes into his body then they got to make him sneeze to, and it's right. just like a sneezing fit and that's how covid starts <laughs> i thought they were gonna dig him out like a bullet i thought they i thought he was gonna poop him out no that would have been like an osmosis jones thing well then we don't really have to do anything do we the stolen chip is useless without the one inside the pod, and we've got that one. You build your duplicates. It doesn't matter how long it takes. And we'll be right back in business. Yeah, but what about Pendleton? We can't save him now, and that's too bad. Thanks, Pete. Maybe we can use him. Bring the perpetrators out into the open. So they decide they're going to get out of there and try to, like, figure this out themselves, so... Tuck is like, go to my locker, get my jacket on. It's got my car keys. Go outside. Like, there's my car. Jack hops in his uh, like Camaro convertible or something. I don't know what kind of car that was. Pretty cool car, though. And they take off to save Tuck's life. What are they doing? I forget. What do you do? I think they were trying to get away and then get back to Tuck's place. So then I guess they can lay low and figure out their next moves. Oh, I guess they probably wanted to extract Tuck. Right? So at least they'll have the ship, even though they can't enlarge him, like they'll have the technology and everything. Yeah. And little That's tiny corpse. So <laughs> he just wanted to get drunk. <laughs> That's funny. My favorite alcoholic. When um <laughs> Jack requests like, hey, just don't do anything weird in there, like sever my spinal cord and be like, Oh, whoopsie. It's okay. I'm only cutting a bunch of holes into your arteries and like <laughs> next to your heart valve. Well, I thought it was going to be something like, uh, give me super strength. And it's just like, just please don't cause me pain. <laughs> and it's like, it's funny, but also it's just so sad. sad. Yeah. I've, I've I'll help you. Just please don't hurt me from inside. <laughs> so Tucker guides him to his own apartment where he proceeds to tell him to, where to find the nearest bottle of booze. And, uh, Tucker sticks his bottle outside the ship with like a mechanical arm and grabs some Southern Comfort as Jack drinks it down his esophagus. He yeah, he cuts a hole in his esophagus and like sticks the sticks. The, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which it makes me you'll, wonder that it's you'll like heal. They, they are aware nothing's been solved just yet, right? <laughs> like the danger is just begun, <laughs> right. and it's well here. Let's do this pissed. so I can fill up my flask. <laughs> And then he knocks back like the entire flask because then he's drunk inside there. He never really resolves like the alcoholism. Uh, that's never, that doesn't go away. No. <laughs> we if don't. there was an inner space too, they would be divorced at the end. <laughs> Jack's the one drinking, so he gets drunk as hell. And uh, Tucker cues up some music that Jack can hear and they just start dancing. And it gets a little Ed Grimley with it again, the way that Martin Short's dancing around the place. I mean, I just liked how 
Tuck all of a sudden starts drinking and turns into like Wolfman Jack from the 60s. Because <laughs> he drinks, he's like, oh, all right. All right, it's like, man. What, when did this happen? <laughs> this next song. There you are. Ooh, ooh. Great Jack. <laughs> Or we get a brush past the part where they need to leave, so um, Tuck has Jack just slap himself sober. Oh, no, we haven't. I'm not brushing past the. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Bam. Um, yeah, that fall was a little much when he hits himself. Uh, it's just like, we need to go. Are you clear headed enough to drive? <laughs> and it's like, slap yourself in the face more again, one more time. And it's like, okay, we're good. It's like, I want to use that next that time. That negates the half <laughs> bottle of whiskey that you just had him pour down his gullet. I don't know. I've heard yeah. it's on the list. It's cold shower, like cup of coffee, and then like violence self-fight to yourself. Club. Yeah, self fight club. That's what's going to get you sober. Um, so yeah, he's not he's not drunk anymore, and we cut to Meg Ryan at her newspaper. Her editor is like just questioning all the shit she's doing. This reminded me of the same newsroom from TMNT. I almost did the look up for it, but oh, the Bay think... movies? No, the um, Secret of the Use. Oh, I know what you're. Yeah, I don't think it is. Hey, there's a guy on the phone. It says his name is Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> The crossover you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Shredder gets into the turtles. Starts cutting them from the inside. <laughs> Super effective. You thought I was problem when I was big. <laughs> Meg Ryan, they're talking about this guy. The cowboy is like supposed to be on his way into town. And it seems to be a not quite running joke that the editor doesn't know who the cowboy is. And by the end of the movie, still asking who was the cowboy. Despite the fact that the cowboy does not make any attempt to hide the fact that he is the cowboy. <laughs> I don't know if we need, does he need to? I mean, that's his whole persona. But the editor makes it sound like I've been trying to find out, but I, I still don't know. Oh. It's like, really? Because you could have <laughs> like gone to the hotel and just waited for like an hour and he'd be like, yeah, that's the cowboy. That guy is absolutely the cowboy. I'm going to fire you if you don't tell me who this cowboy has. We cut to the cowboy who is on an airplane. That cowboy's name is Richard Picardo. Picardo, right? Robert Picardo. Robert Picardo. Meg Mucklebones himself. <laughs> Meg Mucklebones. I forgot about that. He is also the man who sneezed in his helmet in Small Soldiers. We haven't forgotten. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's been at a ton of other stuff. He's in Star Trek. Like this was that guy in his Trek. weirdest role. I didn't know. It is wacky. I knew I knew who it was, and it just it was definitely weird seeing him in it. I just felt I, like he, it wasn't the right casting, but it just felt every time he was on screen, I'm like, man, I don't know how I feel about this. I like how you say this is his weirdest role, and you've seen him emerge from the water as a swamp hag <laughs> to fight Tom Cruise. <laughs> yep. I mean, I think it just gets it really- crazy <laughs> later in this when it's Robert Picardo playing the cowboy, playing Martin Short, playing the cowboy. Yeah, oh, I always loved those. I'm the dude disguised John- as the dude playing another dude. John Travolta playing Nicolas Cage, playing John Travolta. <laughs> yeah, the cowboy <laughs> sits down in his airline seat, immediately tries to smoke a cigar, or immediately the stewardess comes over and is like, put that out. He puts it out on his palm and then, like, smells it. Mmm. There is nothing like a good cigar. <laughs> I would have loved to just have, like, person. two tears streaming down his face. <laughs> <laughs> Holding it back. Be strong. <sighs> Martin Short is driving on the street. They were intentionally looking for Meg Ryan, I guess. Or he just sees her. But they pull over. Lydia's like, What do you think you're doing? Uh, this is Tuck Pendleton's car. Does he know you have this car? No. You'd sooner trust somebody with his oh, lights and with his car. Oh, here we go. You're wearing Tuck's jacket. Why are you Lydia, wearing Tuck's jacket? Lydia, shut up and jacket? listen. You are Lydia, wearing Lydia, shut up Tuck. and listen. Boy, you said it good. Look, uh, Tuck's in trouble. He needs your help. And she buys, she buys it for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess why else would you be driving his car and wearing his jacket, uh, wearing his cologne, wearing his underwear? You're right, he hasn't been seen in a couple days, and I can't get a hold of him, and all of a sudden you have all of his stuff, and you're driving his car, (laughs) and you're saying it's perfectly fine that he's not here. 
<laughs> I'm surprised they waited until like the very end of the movie for Tuck to just feed Jack all of the specific lines that only she would know. Yeah, because I, I wrote that down. It's like, oh, like, yeah, of course, that's how you do it. Um, but why didn't you do it earlier? Why wouldn't that have worked earlier? <laughs> Maybe he just didn't want her to know what he was doing. I don't know. At one point, I think um, Jack even says, like, we should just explain it. And he says she wouldn't believe it anyway. But also, if you know conversations that only the two of you have had or only the two of you would know and all of that stuff, I think it would be a little bit better than just, oh, I promise I know where he is. He's just not here right now. Maybe if we have sex, like Jack, will uh, Tuck will leave my body and like enter yours. <laughs> like ghost <laughs> he can start talking to him <laughs> unchained melody starts playing <laughs> tuck you're gonna want to go to sleep for this one i've got a pottery set up at my place we can do this <laughs> <laughs> um so there it cuts to them at uh having lunch just jack is explaining their cover story that just like he's been kidnapped and held for ransom for a computer chip that they don't have that they need to get back. Um, so just the cover story is that he's kidnapped. And he's very nearby. He's, he's very nearby. Just lots of little cheeky nods to Tuck being inside of Jack. I thought the dick talk was funny, but it's like, you know, it seemed like a cheap joke you could have cut out of the movie. Oh, the bathroom scene. I, I liked it. He's talking to Tuck, but he's looking down, and obviously nobody can hear Tuck except for Jack. It's like, I hate this. Why can't we just tell her the truth? She might even believe us. No. Besides, it's humiliating being this small. What's so bad about being small? I mean, you're not going to be small forever. It's fine if you're little. It's like, you're going to get bigger eventually. <laughs> I guess I mean the funny, fact that you say you you yeah, I was gonna say you say I you hate laugh. that scene and then you're laughing and explaining it. I know. Dean, that's a softball right over your um, plate. Oh, you know what? Okay, you know what I didn't like? I didn't like the guy's line, like play with it, pal. Don't talk to it. That seemed cliche to me. Like Yeah. You should play with it instead of talking to it. Uh, that that's the one that fell off. Yeah, Martin's lines are are funny. I just didn't like that guy's response. I would have just preferred him just like reacting and not saying anything, honestly. Just giving like a Rodney Dangerfield uh, <laughs> yeah. collar pull. Bug eyes, double take. <laughs> he comes back out at the same time that Mr. Igor is comes into the restaurant and grabs him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lydia whips up. She's got like a full taser, like with the hooks, like which seems like you only the police I thought would have, but um, it's the 80s. I don't know. It's a stun gun. Yeah, it's the stun gun. It's it a shoots full the, on stun gun. She accidentally shoots uh, Jack, of course, knocks him out, and it makes Igor's job easier. It's it's funny to me though. Like he seems like this big, imposing, invincible man, and he walks outside, and his car's being towed. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> shit. Well, also, I like how an entire restaurant just lets this man get kidnapped. <laughs> that guy's scary as fuck looking too. So I don't know. I wouldn't want to get in his way. They all just pile on him together as a group. <laughs> you get behind him on all fours and I'll push him down. <laughs> push him down over you. Drop so Mr. Igor up. steals a a meat truck, like a frozen meat truck. Then we get an evil man at the Golden Gate Bridge in his white evil suit. Uh, this is Scrimshaw. We're introduced Scrimshaw. to Scrimshaw. This is halfway. Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy. This is halfway through the movie. We're introduced to, I guess, the big bad. This is the guy who's been masterminding the theft of the chip Which, and everything. They explain, and then later they just explain, it's like, oh, he is the attorney for like all of these high profile bad guys. And it's like, <laughs> wait, so the big bad of this movie is the attorney for other bad guys? <laughs> I decided to do my own thing now. This is the part of law school you don't hear about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he gets in and he's examining um, Jack and the doctor Margaret comes in and just wants to immediately fuck him let me take care of him I know how to warm him up knock it off Margaret she just they just set her up as like this nymphomaniac it's just kind of a character trait that doesn't lead anywhere really it's just like she's just sex crazy because um, she's like I can warm him up and like rubs his thigh and he's like get 
knock that off. Like, get out of here. <laughs> like it's rascally. Like she's a wily sex doctor. He takes out like a bottle and just sprays her. Go. <laughs> <laughs> That image is killing me. <laughs> Famed actor Kevin McCarthy as he just <laughs> sprays a woman with a bottle. <laughs> so Scrimshaw gets in the back while Mr. Igor is driving. I don't know if you caught the music that he... So I, Mr. Igor puts on headphones and start listening to music while they drive. <laughs> yeah. And it's just you hear, Oh, praise the angel of death. And it's like metal music. <laughs> <laughs> And I like how it's him listening to that and then it cuts back and it's just um, Jack like frozen and then Scrimshaw is just like monologuing on something of like, my time in Antarctica, yeah. I learned the Eskimo way. <laughs> and he's just going and going and going oh, as all of this is happening. I read a tidbit about that. Apparently, it seems hard to believe, but apparently in the script, it's just like Jack listening to Tuck talk to him, like try to... Um, yeah. Hype him up to jump out the back door. But it'd be weird to just have Scrimshaw just like sitting there in silence. Yeah, so they they wrote on the day this like crazy speech for him to do. <laughs> so all that was like written on the day, apparently. <laughs> I wanted it to be even weirder. It's like nobody's paying attention to that or listen to the talk jack stuff. And that that's been a where good... his lord lies sleeping beneath the waves. <laughs> that's that why we're doing good... this, Jack. It would have been a good yeah, thing to do just like for people that rewatch the movie. Like, what the fuck is he talking? <laughs> I'm sorry, Tuck. One second. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> you want to resurrect too? <laughs> Tuck has uh, Jack look around, scan the room. He notices the doors to the truck are not locked. So he just starts like hyping in the hell up. Like, you can do this. See yourself being the hero. I learned the ways of the Eskimo moment, and the alley It all comes not a down to people, this. Jack. You're not the same man you were this morning, are you, Jack? You're better, you're stronger, you're a man in control of your own destiny, Jack. Psych yourself up, Jack. See yourself opening the doors, Jack. See yourself jumping from the truck, Jack. You're not going to back groceries all your life, are you, Jack? Are you? See yourself being a hero, Jack. Psych yourself up. Nam yo ringi kyom, nam yo ringi kyom, nam yo ringi kyom. What language is that? But it kind of came out of nowhere, but apparently it's like a Buddhist. I forget what the translation was, but... It's actually the command words for Jack. (laughs) I must kill the queen. I'm activated. (laughs) Uh, I was surprised here because, so yeah, you'd think he's going to kick the doors open and jump out, but he just grabs onto the door and now Jack is hanging onto the door, swinging down the road. Meanwhile, um, Lydia is following and seeing this all play out, but like, there's obviously stuntmen work, but then there's times where it's like, oh, Martin Short is like strapped into this, like actually going down the road. Yeah. Which was like, I was like, wow, like that's, that's awesome that they could get him to safely do something like that. Cause like he's actually hanging off the door, like touching the car with his feet and he's like standing <laughs> on the car, like going you know, down that's, the road. That's the, the other great thing about like lack of CGI is like, yeah, we're going to have to make blood platelets and we're going to have to actually create a miniaturized version of the sub. And Martin Short, you're really going to have to hang off this moving truck going at full speed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> really? Yeah, you had to force actors to do some shots. But yeah, there's a part where he's he lets go and he's standing on the car. I assume there's some kind of apparatus he's strapped to hanging above him that we, you know with the wires and everything was like, Oh, he's actually just standing on the um, windshield of this convertible. <laughs> like it's in a moving car. <laughs> <clears throat> Great job. Eat your heart out. Tom Cruise. Yeah. I don't care if you're hanging off the Burj Khalifa. <laughs> <laughs> Martin short did it back in the eighties. Tom Cruise actually said he was inspired by Martin short in the film inner space. <laughs> so I can see his face and he's in real danger. Fine. I'm going to do it with two tiny men injected into me. <laughs> <laughs> I developed technology to be able to have this. <laughs> destroyed it after the film. <laughs> Cowboy arrives, and so they're going to go follow him in and do whatever. Then we cut to Scrimshaw. <laughs> Scrimshaw is sitting in what I guess you could. I guess it's his office, but it's just a. It's an, a sad it's, office. It's, a, it's, a, it's an empty industrial, like a twenty, you know, a ten thousand square foot and empty industrial floor that you 
see a photographer what? shooting in with just his little corner that's like lit up with fuchsia pink lights and his dogs <laughs> yeah. on his glass table. Because uh, it was like this close up and then you're like, okay, that's kind of cool. And it just like pans out and it's just like, oh, it's just this sad little like decorated right. it's a reveal. corner of this building. It's a reveal. It's like one little tiny corner of this floor is just his, his, his space, which... I have to think that's like a production decision being like, we don't know where to shoot this. Um, and then they just get this idea to make it a joke. Like, I don't, I can't imagine it was scripted like that. It seems too weird. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just, it stands out. It's funny. I really thought it was the whole thing was pink, but it's just a single thing. Cause he's, everything is white. It's yeah. He's that. wearing, yeah. What he's wearing white and the lights are pink. Oh, they're on him. But the first time seeing that, that's when I, I thought it was just everything was pink. Oh, gotcha. Until that reveal where it's like, yeah. oh, it's just, it's just a light. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. It, this whole scene, he's talking to Dr. Margaret, and she's just getting ready to have sex with some, like, it doesn't matter who it is, just somebody. Just like, oh, she's getting ready to screw somebody, because that's her character. She's just, oh, did you not realize who it was? Wait, who who is it? I go. Oh, it's oh, it is. I go. I saw. I just saw. Because, he took his hand off. Well, yeah, because he all puts of a sudden on, he like what he pops the champagne with like the the corkscrew the cork. hand, and then he undoes that hand and puts another hand on, and then you just hear a vibration start, and they just look <laughs> at each other. I missed it because they don't show his face, but obviously the hand sells it. I must have been writing notes. Well, I it's going to be in the sequel, Inner Space Two: The Search for the G Spot. It's <laughs> from inside. <laughs> completely missed that joke but it was funny that's now it's even more funny then we see the cowboy buffing his he's like he got a pile of cowboy boots he's deciding what to wear he's got the weirdest like perm <laughs> like little quaffed perm fro going on meanwhile jack's kind of analyzing tuck's relationship with lydia to see if he can slide into the dms maybe for some reason it seems like lydia's hot for it she's into it she seems like weirdly attracted to him. Well, after a very abusive relationship, usually the first thing that you go to is either another abusive relationship or the complete polar opposite. Right. So Martin Short is absolutely nothing. He's like the Tuck. abuser. Oh, yeah. He's the opposite. <laughs> we find out that he's been injected into the body of a serial killer. <laughs> Tuck, my place is found. We need to go back to your apartment. No. No, we're good. Yeah, so it's like Jack is, seems like he's falling, starting to be real into Lydia at this point. But then she's like, oh, the cowboy's on the move. So they hop in the car to tail him to Club Inferno. Inferno. This looked like Wayne Garth would be in that crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our girlfriend is in there. Lots of guys' girlfriends are in there. <laughs> um <laughs> When do we do Wayne's World? <laughs> Soon, I'm sure. It's my next pick. Also, is this... It, it seemed like they were pulling up to a ship. The way the smoke is, like, it, it hides part of the building. It just... I don't know. I thought it was like a... Like a decommissioned battleship turned into do a they club. Ha- like, I've been to clubs before. They look nothing like this. And I... In my 20s, I especially long for a place that was like the bronze from Buffy... Or just like all of the different clubs that Wayne went to. I don't remember ever seeing something anywhere near relevant to being that close to real life. Like, did we did we just miss that entire thing and it just completely stopped by the time we were going out there? Because the nightclubs I remember going to were just pumping out, you know, hip hop and yeah. R- not, not R&B, but like hip hop, rap and some pop music. And it was just nothing to this kind of caliber. There's less barbed wire and steam in today's clubs yeah just yeah i miss the the early 90s when i wasn't um in clubbing scene um in time to have like labouche and all of that all of like the house where you have like one female singer and then there's one guy that just like talk raps through the last that was your that was your club era that was my jam that would i would go to clubs for that (laughs) That was my mom's era. That's how I know all those songs. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the credits roll, and we never know what happens. You know, you keep joking, but that is how the movie ends. 
<laughs> I was so mad. It is. I was so mad. It is just set up like, we're doing part two. But they're at the club. Ricardo's dancing. Ricardo. <laughs> the cowboy. <laughs> Richard Picard. Ricardo. <laughs> I like how no variation of his name is Ricardo. <laughs> Robert Picardo. <laughs> Richard Robert Picardo. Um, that's where like uh, Meg Ryan, Lydia gets his attention. It's dancing with him. Wendy Shaw is there by chance. and was like, oh shit. Like, Jack, you're cool now because you wear oversized clothes. <laughs> when did you have this double life? <laughs> yeah. Oh, for a long time, I've had this double life. And good for him at the end of the movie when she's like, oh, you want to go out sometime? He's like, not in your life. Yeah, he stands <laughs> up for you, it. Man. But here she's like, oh, wow. Like, you know what? I've been mean to you, I think, because my life kind of sucks. <laughs> Which I guess it sounds kind of sad, but like, obviously Jack's attention is elsewhere and just kind of lets it roll off and isn't really concerned with anything she's saying that much. But um, Cowboys decides to leave and like take in Meg with him. So that prompts Martin to leave. Martin, uh, Jack. So the face scene. I'll admit, I kind of spaced out a little bit toward this point in the movie. Because basically I looked down at my phone and it's just like Martin Short bursting into the Cowboys room. And then the next thing I look up and Martin Short's doing like this weird kind of <laughs> face thing that's going on. What? I didn't have time to rewind. So what, what, what happened here? Yeah, okay. So... Jack follows them back to the hotel. Obviously, Lydia's trying to get intel. But in the meantime, Tuck is like pumping Jack's adrenal glands. So he's got a bunch of adrenaline running. He's like, I don't know why I'm so angry at you. God, I can't believe how hostile I feel towards you right now. Because I'm stimulating your adrenal gland, pal. Yeah, well, maybe that's the reason and maybe not. Look, you got something to say? Why don't you just say it, huh? She deserves better. That's all. Better than what? Better than you. Ah, I knew it. You think she goes for you, don't you, pal, huh? Well, you know what she sees in you, Jack? She sees me. All right, Pendleton, that's it. Where are you? Where are you, you little weasel? Save it for the cowboy. Kicks down the door, knocks him out, and then Jack's like, stare at him, stare at him, look at his face. And, you know, somehow they've got technology. It scans Cowboy's face. This and it's like for a rabbit. What were you going to do with this in a <laughs> rabbit? Actually, turn him into Bugs Bunny. The bug, the rabbit's name was Bugs, which I thought a, was kind of a cute, rabbit with but. a human face. <laughs> face. Imagine the screams from that bunny as the Wasn't face there, transforms. Were they trying to recreate that 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 claymation rabbit that was in the Michael Jackson movie? Wait, I, you, oh, you the Captain that? Captain EO, Captain Eno, was it? I don't remember. Oh my, I've never saw that. But my thing is like, okay, great. They developed this technology that they're testing and yada, yada. Why don't they have this technology be getting used for anything? Because yeah. like, this seems like the more impressive thing of, oh, yeah, we can use electrical impulses to just have one person's entire face change into another person's. I mean, criminals would be chomping at the bit to have this technology for sure. Government agents, spy agencies. This is mission. what they do at Mission Impossible. It's just another variation of it. And well, in Mission Impossible, didn't they... In the first one, it just looked like it was just really good prosthetics. Yeah, I think the first time you see him, it's like he looks like an old man. And it's like, yes. But then it just becomes like they're exactly that somebody else in the movie. Yeah. Cut to pulling the prosthetic off. But that's what prompts this crazy face change. He scans the cowboy's face and it's like, all right, I'm going to stimulate your muscles and completely change your bone structure somehow to match that of the cowboy and it's your a height movie. and your hair yeah oh, no, the height <laughs> um so that's why he goes through that transformation but if this is the scene that gave him the oscar definitely uh i think it definitely was worth it this probably was like maybe the icing on the cake the one later on i'd say is probably just well, they, as good yeah if not better they do uh I would say it's obvious if you think about what's going on, but Jack comes out of the bathroom and now he is the cowboy. Like his face, he's obviously it's that actor. It's like he just looks exactly like him, but he's got Jack's hair instead of his. no. It is Martin Short, <laughs> and he just had that much prosthetics on him that he's able to just grab his cheek and pull it around. Perfect replication. <laughs> but he comes out of the bathroom, he's trying to convince Lydia that it's him. 
he ducks off frame and you know in that moment is when he goes off stage because this is all one shot there's no cuts he goes off camera runs behind the stage does a quick you know probably rips his co- clothes off does a costume change and then gets into the bathtub because like a body double comes out and does the rest of the scene with Meg Ryan and she's like go in look look in the bathroom and then she goes in and there's Robert Picardo laying in the bathtub when he was just out in the other room so he obviously had to like they had to do that practically he had to run back and change and put a new wig on all in like a matter of 40 seconds 30 seconds and it- and during the transformation too, you see him gagged, and he's knocked out, and he wakes up enough to see the, the horror of Martin Short in mid transformation, and it's enough to knock him back out again. Like, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> um. So with this new tool, they take off for Scrimshaw's compound to do this meeting with the um, the chip, and they do the kind of the under the expected kind of dance like hey you seem different cowboy you're you're doing things different nowadays i like that they did a callback that didn't seem to make sense at first but now it does because when we first are introduced to the cowboy he's on a plane and he lights up a cigar the flight attendant comes by and she's like sir you can't smoke that in here so he takes the lit cigar and he not like he puts it out in his hand and he doesn't even bat an eye right and i think that's the only time we see this and or right. anything similar to it because scrimshaw says you know just to prove you really are who you say you are the cowboy is notor- is like well known for having his lack of um f- like he's he's immune to pain that makes sense now. I, I get thought it was that just now. something like he knew the jig was up, but he was just kind of like messing with him, mm-hmm. which he was. But yeah, he liked cigars and he had no issues with pain. Yeah, that makes that sense. Makes though. More sense. But they got it. They were going to get intense with that pain tolerance thing. <laughs> the float. I really <laughs> like feel if he didn't do the face thing, even though he was like, "No, no, no, we're joking. It's just a prank. We're not, not really going to do that." I really feel like they would have if it was the real cowboy right which was ridiculous because igor is just holding a blowtorch to the guy's face (laughs) (laughs) you're immune to pain right (laughs) not damage pull down your pants (laughs) we all know the cowboy loves pounding nails oh never mind (laughs) (laughs) you know you've heard of stigmata right He almost loses his cover, too, because that's when the anxiety and stress of about being blowtorched in the face kind of makes his uh, face start to <laughs> yeah. change Starts back. To lose control. But it actually ends up changing back anyway, and the jig is up. Um, yeah, that transformation is crazy because the camera's moving, so I wonder how much is sped up and how fast the camera's moving because his head is shaking. It looks like it's shaking back and forth at you know, 100 miles an hour. Because <laughs> there's motion blur and everything in there, so it's probably sped up somewhat, but it's like, I don't know, it was really impressive looking transformation These kinds of, like, sight gags doesn't really make me laugh, but this one actually kind of did. Which yeah. just, it looked like compressed air blowing into his mouth and then reacting <laughs> yeah. to it. And I yeah. swear to God, when he's shaking his head super fast, I could have sworn I saw, like, Christopher Lloyd's face in there a couple yes. of times. <laughs> I, now that you say that, Yeah. But I didn't. I didn't catch that. I didn't think that while watching. But it's very uh, total recall. But blinking, you miss it. The uh, it. It's definitely. It definitely felt like it was there. I see a mix. I say. I say a mix of Christopher Lloyd and the Harry Dean Stanton. <laughs> in that sh- <laughs> that fast shaking part. Yeah, but yes, the, the tussle ends up getting the chip thrown across the room into the Scrimshaw's into the dog bowl. Dog bowl, and he eats it up. He doesn't. He doesn't eat it up. He doesn't. He finds, it, he finds it right away. It's kind of like Almost. a few moment for them. Few. Almost would have been like um, gone in 60 seconds. Where oh, we got to walk the dog now. How much Pepto-Bismol did you give it? <laughs> the jig is up. Jack and Lydia are now hostage in the uh, an unfinished basement in that really nice house. I don't know what kind of like tornado shelter this is. That's when they decide to... Oh, go ahead. I felt a lot of the scenes were 
reusing sets from other things because when they were in that basement thing, it really looked familiar like I'd seen it before from a different movie. Did you figure it out? No. God damn it. I just felt that way when I watched it. <laughs> Same thing with... Um, you might not be wrong. I don't know. Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan r- are arguing outside of his apartment. I mean, obviously it's San Francisco, but I feel like the Tanners from Full House was just like right next door. Or at least it was that same neighborhood. No, right. I see what you mean. So they finally decide to tell Lydia the whole story here. Or they kind of breeze past it. And then she's like, doesn't believe it. And then it's like, okay, finally, I'll tell her these things that only I would know. And then that whole trope works. Immediately starts kissing Jack like it's Tuck. I get it. It's a movie. But I thought it was really interesting that. Tuck seemed to be in the guy's mouth at that point in time, and it was just he's become a sexually transmitted disease at this point. <laughs> and he's able to just on, beam between uh, two different people without even realizing it. At this point, you don't know that he's transferred into Lydia until you see the... Tuck finds out he's a dad because he goes to the womb. <laughs> he ends up in the <laughs> womb and sees his unborn child growing there, the fetus. Gonna, this could have been a much darker movie. <laughs> yeah. God. Or what if all of a sudden the baby like woke up and just like crushed him? Yeah. I can't be a father yet. I have to do something. <laughs> it's so, so messed up. Its eyes just snap open. <laughs> you would think he would just kind of park himself <laughs> instead of constantly floating around. But I mean, I'm yeah, thinking too much into it. Fuel free. <laughs> Uh, so they're on their way. They're being taken to Scrimshaw's lab. Meanwhile, Tuck is like out of communication. He doesn't know where he is. But as we mentioned, he's been transferred to Lydia, but we haven't seen all that stuff play out yet. The The plan is to inject Mr. Igor in their own little like jetpack style Boba Fett vertical suit here. <laughs> and he's going to get the chip that they need they need the second ship because they have the first one already they're going to get it from the ship and just leave tuck for dead inside and then they're just going to re you're going to embiggen embiggen him kind of like the ant-man plan where everybody said don't just one of these and crawl up thanos ass and get larger <laughs> that's what they're <laughs> that's what's going to happen in their eyes lydia escapes from the dude who's guarding her because he accidentally touches her shotgun what's it called nick uh, her stun gun stun which gun. i guess which i guess he accidentally touched the trigger of the stun gun while aiming it at him <laughs> tuck realizes he's in lydia because he comes face to face with the old fetus there i'm glad he was able to put two and two together because i feel in some other movies it would have been way too, why do you have like a small person inside you jack it took what's me a second because i saw like all you see at first is the forearm and the hand. And I'm like, what the fuck is in Martin Short's body that's, oh, wait, oh, wait, it's a woman. It is a tumor. It's not a tumor. So Lydia pops in uh, just as they do or about to inject uh, Mr. Igor. She's got that dude's gun, I guess, fires it. And she knows how to use it. Yeah. I feel like Tuck is like the, the one ring at this point. And whoever has him inside their body immediately is empowered to do all of these things that they never normally would do on a day-to-day kind of thing. She doesn't strike me as the type to knock out a guy, take their gun, and then just like start waving it around and shooting people. As That's a good to point. <laughs> and then Martin Short was like the scaredy cat, you know, neurotic hypochondriac. And now he's like going into nightclubs. He's getting drunk. He's going on wild car chases. Some of them are not held at gunpoint, and he's doing it on his own free will. Until they realize they had this power all along. (laughs) So she's got them at gunpoint, forces them into the miniaturization area. They're fussing with the buttons, trying to get the chip out. They close the door on them. There's like the main two baddies, and then all their their couple scientists down there with them too. Uh, They accidentally change the shrinking percentage to 50%, and unbeknownst to uh, Martin Short... And Meg Ryan, they shrink uh, the baddies down there, but then they they get the chip and hightail it out of there. Uh, Jack is like emboldened by having Tuck inside. Like he'll give me powers, like Nick was saying. And he just, but he hasn't had him inside him for the last you know 
30 minutes. I like how his, his, his like his, his, his go-to thought is, Tuck will give me the strength of 10 men. <laughs> and he knocks the guy out, but it's just all on his own thing. It's like, I don't think. It was you the he, whole time. The whole but time. But he does like, it's like, I thought, oh, he's going to like realize he doesn't have this power and then like chicken out. But then he kicks him in the face. So it's like, oh, okay. Well, I like the arc of him still being silly but he's actually useful and then he starts to believe in himself and it's like he just stays useful the rest of the movie right like he's not just a punchline right up to the very end right like he's just as much as a hero in this movie as dennis quaid is absolutely oh, yeah. he has a nice character arc and i did appreciate it what if he's like yeah tuck's telling me to kill you now and lydia's <laughs> like uh <laughs> do you still hear those voices yeah, they never left I hear them even stronger now. Uh, he must be in my ear. Deep in slumber, Tuck lies dreaming. Yeah, Tuck uses that opportunity to let him know or let Lydia know he's inside her now by playing their their song. Oh, that's later on. No, oh, wait, no that the, is right the, there. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. As they're escaping, he does that. I, I glossed over that. <laughs> then their method of like, quick, let's let's put him back in your body. So they just start kissing, assuming that it's going to work. I... I I just imagine like how much I just imagine her just Suction. she just like spitting like into his mouth like <laughs> like you see him you see him like flowing through the saliva and it's like how much is, how wet is this kiss that she's just like just drooling into his mouth blah or how much is he sucking on his end all of a sudden like her cheeks just cave in <laughs> like the scene is pretty uh, uh, yeah. Hey, want to suck face? I just think of that kiss from like Dumb and Dumber during the dream sequence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grabbing her face. <laughs> but it made me laugh when they escape in the car and they're driving away from the lab and they're trying to get to the real lab to, you know, hand in the, the chip now that they have it. But the two, Scrimshaw and the other doctor, are now in the car as well, 50% smaller. <laughs> but that recent fad of people using like the tiny hands yeah that's exactly <laughs> it. it's basically what they do that's what it the looks tiny like hands comes up and it uh tries to strangle martin they Short are fighting the, the small people yeah to reiterate they are 50 percent the size they're half the size they used to be so they're essentially <laughs> two and a half foot tall people is it like his little like the shoes kicking up at his <laughs> <Yeah>. face <laughs> it's actually really impressive how they did this it's um You'd think it, I was like, wow, this green screen look like the matting is like really nice, but no, it's forced perspective. They're sitting they like Lord of the Rings. They're sitting like feet back from the front seat. It's like a whole set and it's like a huge back seat and they're actually there. And obviously with tiny arms practically around the actors, but you see there huh. that it wasn't screen matted in. It's they're there. It's a forced perspective shot. Because I, I, it struck me at first, I was like, wow, that looks like seamless. Like, I can't believe that for 1987. Hey, it won an Oscar. Yeah, it sure did. All that stuff. <laughs> when Lydia smacks the doctor, just like bitch slaps her. <laughs> it's just like, it fulfills this like, I had a, what were they called? Like a My Buddy doll around the time. That Good I first doll? saw Child's Play. Oh, you had and, like two. I beat the shit out of that doll after I saw Child's Play, and it just <laughs> that <laughs> Dean just circling it. Come on, <laughs> my that, stepdad came over and I pleaded with him, please, when you leave, take this thing with you, because my grandmother <laughs> bought it for me, not even thinking. Yeah, and then my stepdad's like, "Why the hell do you want me to take this? Like, can't you just throw it out?" And my mom explains it to him, and he's like. He told her after the fact, when I left your house, I swear to God, I wanted to get the thing out of my car and I didn't trust it. <laughs> he looks yeah. out the window, a flash of lightning, and he sees you burying it in the backyard. Ugh. But her smacking little <laughs> Dr. Margaret like that just brought back this childhood satisfaction of like me hitting that doll like, yeah, fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> like, get out of my life. I just picture... Like a tiny Dean still with his now beard circling around <laughs> this doll. With Gary Busey smaller. and Silver Bullet when he takes on the werewolf. <laughs> That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> but I laughed out loud when it's like she smacks her and like just that sound effect of the smacking just made me laugh. 
simultaneously, yeah, Tuck is fighting Mr. Igo, who's like trying to just you know, destroy his life support, his oxygen, just ruin his little pod. Uh, meanwhile, this whole action scene is taking place. They're driving. They're being <laughs> being attacked by the tiny villains. They eventually crash over whatever fence. They end up on a beach, and just like that's where the car and car uh, chase ends. And Pete has been tailing them, or, or catches up to them, and. They hop in the truck with Pete, who was from the earlier in the movie. But he's like kind of a good guy now, I guess, by this point. Meanwhile, Tuck is still trying to deal with the foreign object that got lodged in, and it's <laughs> Mr. Igo. And here is where he gets dislodged. So they have like a scuffle at first, and they get his ship that he's in gets really messed up from Igo's mech thing because yeah. it's just meant for pure damage and it's just wrecking right. Tuck's ship and it gets dislodged I, from his esophagus and he gets thrown into uh like the valve that controls the esophagus into the stomach part of me cringes every time I see them like cutting into Martin Short or like hooks digging into like whatever like I know it's like yeah tiny but I'm just like oh that looks like just imagining that like happening inside my body <laughs> I hate it. It cuts back to Jack and he's just screaming. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing oh. I asked you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, their tussle, like, it's it seems like Martin Short is feeling whatever's going on because he's freaking out. The tussle, yeah, ends up towards the, uh, the sphincter from the stomach, from the esophagus towards the stomach. And um, I don't know why he needed stomach acid did that make sense to anybody because he was hanging tuck, and he figured tuck would try to at least do like a suicide run and dive into the pool but he needed more acid to be like i don't know why it had to be higher because the acid was there regardless that's what i meant that's what i was like i need more acid i'm like Wait, why why do you need more acid so he just <laughs> stresses jack out by saying he sees like cancer <laughs> in his stomach <laughs> he's like there oh my, my ulcer. ulcer yeah so that makes his acid act up and does whatever Tuck wants, I guess. But it ends up killing Mr. Igo. He falls into does this the make, stomach acid. Does this make Jack a cannibal? Yeah, I guess I guess it does. <laughs> like, it's one thing to just have him, like, disappear down in the stomach acid. But he just, like, smelts into, like, his goopy <laughs> <Yeah>. corpse. <laughs> Like, I say it time and time again, Joe Dante does all of these fun films that has just enough edge to it that it's like, yeah, I could have watched this as a kid. There'd be some stuff that I'm like, ooh, that's rough. Seeing but it it's again, not, not it, for me. It almost reminds me of when Stripe and Gremlins yep. gets exposed to like the water and then he jumps out when it's like surrounded in sunlight. Right. It's not the yeah. same imagery, but it almost reminds me of that kind of like grotesque thing that comes out, and it's just like the skeleton <laughs> and the green goop. I like his blood curdling scream as they like plummet towards the acid. Like, <laughs> he instantly... should let out a Howie scream. Yeah, oh, I would have been so mad. <laughs> oh, Howie, I wouldn't be mad at. It would be uh, the oh, the Wilhelm. One. Yeah, but somehow it dissolves Igo and not uh, Tuck ship. Well, the lining of his ship is made entirely of Prilosec. <laughs> and then we cut to Scrimshaw standing on Dr. Margaret's shoulders, making a phone call at a phone booth, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I think is probably a mix of green screen and practical forced perspective. Obviously, he's holding a humongous telephone, but um, just another funny visual with them. I want to watch. I wish the sequel was made just so it was more tiny them jokes. Them getting smacked around more <laughs> as tiny people. Um, but uh, Tuck is struggling because he's losing oxygen. Um, so they're hauling ass into the lab. This is where they just kind of quickly explain everything. He's made it into Jack's lung. And uh, he's trying to get him to sneeze. And um, oh yeah, it was set up early in the movie. And his first doctor appointment, that is, he's allergic to hairspray. So that comes back. He's like, somebody give me some hairspray. It's like, not moose. Somebody hands a moose and just like goopy shit coming out. <laughs> not moose. Um, 
inhales the hairspray. And then, yeah, there's no plan. She's like, he's going to sneeze. They're just waiting for him to sneeze. I'm like, where's Tuck going to go? <laughs> right on to old What's-His-Faces. I, this, I forget this character's name. He's a familiar actor. Dr. Niles. Just, Dr. Niles. Yeah. So, yeah, Jack sneezes right into his face. And um, they, like, hold the doctor, they hold Niles steady. The guy puts on his <laughs> microscope microscope glasses i don't know what the hell those are it's like a amplifiers as they call them <laughs> amplifiers that's like a precursor to tim's night vision goggles in jurassic park but um <laughs> he gets a pair of tweezers and extracts uh tuck onto like a uh, id card and they place him into the machine to i'm be glad they ambiguous. did like the water droplet onto the tweezers because i thought he was oh, gonna yeah. actually Tweeze it. I'm like, man, yeah, man yeah. you got a robot to move a computer chip three feet, but you're going to actually just freehand. <laughs> just tweeze him raw. <laughs> tweeze just, him raw. Just cut to him being crushed. <laughs> <laughs> I was oh. so close. <laughs> yeah, so they re enlarge him and everything's hunky dory. This is the happy moment. He's He comes out alive and meets Jack for the first time and he's making out with Meg Ryan and Jack's like, oh, I wish that was me. And then Jack remembers, oh, that was me a little <laughs> while ago. <laughs> Later on, they just had this these looks like, after like she's married. And I'm yeah, like, why like are you these, still doing these like these longing stares? Why these like, will they hmm. won't they stares? And she's just married. She's leaving with her husband. <laughs> while pregnant with his child. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless you find out that's actually Jack's. <laughs> Damn, you work fast, Jack. He in that lab must have done something. But yeah, it's just it's all happy. Then it cuts to right to the wedding. They're getting married. I assumed I was like, wait, are those their kids? But I guess they're just wedding guests children. Because it starts with like they're preceded by a bunch of kids, and it's like, wait, are they how far in the future is this? Well, it's just some <laughs> guests, I guess. Being in that lab has changed us all. <laughs> they had twins <laughs> several years apart, and they're the same age. <laughs> The kid's born and instantly just grows old in front of them, turns to a skeleton. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, Tuck and Lydia got married, and Tuck might be still an alcoholic, and that's going to be a problem for them later on still. We don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything just seems happy for the moment. I do like all these callbacks with these characters, like, trying to get his attention now because tuck and lydia take off lydia also kisses him on the lips too like that's that's a weird one it only wouldn't have been weird if then tuck also does that (laughs) (laughs) it was a different time back then jack's like how how awfully european (laughs) uh and then it's oh it's a surprise we noticed the cowboy because of his hair pretty much is yeah, they the, give us the big trouble little China ending. <laughs> the uh, boots helped out quite a bit. Too, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah I, I love how it takes Jack at least a minute or two to realize that was the cowboy. And then he just gets in his car. It threw me because we Jack makes a joke like they didn't notice my cufflink. And it's the computer chip on his cufflink. And then I see the cowboy. I'm like, oh, shit. Are they selling this to the cowboy? Like, is he brokering a deal with them somehow? It was a really weird decision that, if that they he took got, the chip. If he got the chips as cufflinks, I would imagine at this point they have another set and copies. these no longer work. <laughs> you know, or like they're not the real things. And if they are the real things, they no longer work anymore. So trying to get them is it, it's it's stupid. Yeah, really. It's like Dotson hiring Nedry to not only steal dinosaur stuff, but he gets like the weak old scraps that are no longer viable. Like, at this point, it's just, what it, cool. Yeah, these were, but they're no longer. I want to see how they pull off that shot in the trunk, because Cowboy has loaded a suitcase into the trunk, and he opens it up to reveal Tiny, Scrimshaw, and Margaret are hiding in there. And then, but then they close it, and it's like, it's a real size hand, but they're in oh, it's a... It's a fake su- hand. It's, it's absolutely you think it's just a, a big. Do you think it's just no, a I, big one, like a big, a I huge watched, fake hand? I just watched it now. You absolutely could tell it's a fake hand. Okay. Because it's just <clears> kind of, <throat> you can see my hand on camera. It just does that. But it doesn't even move. Oh, that's true. Or naturally. It, yeah, I'm just looking at it. It doesn't open, doesn't close. Yeah. 
the fist, I mean. Like when the hobbits are at the, the dancing, the prancing pony, and you see the people walk past them without, like, if you're not examining it closely, it looks pretty natural. But when you're looking for the fact that these guys are actually people in suits and like stilts to make them look like they're so much larger, you can absolutely tell that these are not just people walking by. There's I guess I just still wonder, like, did they build hu- a huge hand? I don't know. I want to see. Yeah, they absolutely how they did, did that. It looks great, Oscar winning. I truly was expecting there to be like a pit mid or post credits thing, because the way that the movie just leaves off, it's like, oh no, that was that was the cowboy. He gets in his car, he chases after him, and that's it. Like what? I don't even know if there was ever any intent to make a sequel. I think it was just like you ended on well. Then another adventure begins. I mean, if it probably made a lot of money, they would have been like, all right, let's do it again. <laughs> and that's the movie. The movie's over. What would you think of the movie? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. It's whack. It definitely goes off the, not off the rails, I guess, plot wise. Like it's just kind of a little wacky, but I was along for the ride. I spaced toward the middle. He's spaced. I did this space. is one where I, I did I didn't like that I had to keep making notes because I was just kind of like watching the movie. I think it's probably better than deserved a better shake at the box office. I'd imagine it's rough having to go up against Adventures in Babysitting with like Elizabeth Shue Prime in uh, nineteen what was it this year eighty seven the week before it. I mean, Full Metal Jacket had come out as well as Spaceballs and Dragnet. The week after it was a Revenge of the Nerds sequel. That was a pretty good month overall, though, because that's when we got Lost Boys. June and July were crazy of that year. We got Jaws for the Revenge with Michael Caine. <laughs> also, this movie called The Squeeze with Michael Keaton came out, which has a really unfortunate poster, if you go back and look at it. <laughs> now uh, I'm going to. I, I went to post it, have it ready to post. I meant to bring it up earlier, but yeah, it's not, not a great poster when you have to look back at it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the, Ugh. it's Keaton standing between the world trade buildings and like this hand is like crushing them from outside. It doesn't retroactively work anymore. <laughs> Thank you again for coming along for this adventure on Inner Space. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating, review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Help others find us. For Tim and Nick, this is Dean saying, don't get shrunk. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks for Rule of Thirds. I need a drink of I need a drink of water. Hockey pads. Hockey pads. <laughs>